Okay, yeah, so uh, thanks again so much for organizing uh, the meeting and uh, for everyone coming. Uh, so I'll basically mainly talk about a few of our recent works on really trying to extend ideas from uh, heterostructure engineering of twisted bilayers or multilayers to materials beyond graphene. So the basic idea and the premise for what we would like to do is really try and find new materials platforms beyond graphene of particular compositions of different heterostructures that can be used to simulate paradigmatic quantum Hamiltonians and perhaps explore regimes that are not readily accessible in the solid in the sense that they uh, constitute a particular regime of parameters that would be considered extreme for uh, regular uh, kinetic energy scales in the solid, but can actually arise quite naturally at a twist in uh, tailored heterostructures. Uh, so, okay, well, I guess the this doesn't really need much introduction for this meeting, So, but the basic idea really uh, is just a question of extending the paradigm set by twisted bilayer graphene, where it was shown that at uh, small twist angles, particularly around magic angles, uh, the super lattice potential or interference in the super lattice potential acts as a knot to uh, quench the kinetic energy scale and instead really bring interaction mediated physics to the forefront. So in graphene, of course, this led to well-known observations of uh, correlated insulating states as well as superconductivity as a function of filling, which is also finely tunable in these heterostructures via gate control. And this has really been extended to be a variety of graphene systems, namely not just bilayers, but trilayers or bi bilayers in various experimental groups. Uh, but sort of a broader perspective on this uh, is to ask whether this very same physics can also generalize to materials away from graphene, uh, in particular other van der Waals materials, such as transition metal dichal trogonite uh, mono and multilayers. So again, the idea is, well, you start with a material where the intrinsic kinetic energy scale is at a fairly high energy scale that's going to be EVs. However, as you compose multiple layers and stack them at a twist, uh, the question is whether this paradigm of quenching the kinetic energy scale can bring other competing effects to the forefront. So this now has been extended in various ways by various groups. Uh, in particular, there's been a lot of experimental efforts on the 2H uh, transition metal dichalchogonite uh, multilayers at a twist, for instance, twisted tungsten diselenide or tungsten, tungsten disulfide, where one starts from a semiconducting monolayer and then essentially builds a Lego construction, which is uh, of uh, layering these materials on top of each other at a twist and finds that while there are no magic angles, unlike graphene, which is a property that is very unique to Dirac semi-metals at a twist, uh, one nevertheless finds a uh, twist angle reduced uh, kinetic energy scale that leads to quasi flat uh, more bands at the top of the original valence band which if one can gate into them can realize again a variety of correlated insulating states and other interesting states of matter. So however this is not the end of the story because really there's more aspects or more parameters in the material that would what could think about controlling and really make uh, become a dominant energy scale at low energies. So on one hand an open question is the question of dimensionality so uh, heterostructures by design are essentially two-dimensional. However, one can ask whether one can go slightly beyond this. Particularly, one can either ask about dimensional reduction, namely starting from a two-dimensional heterostructure and asking whether twist angle gives a way to reduce dimensions from 2D to 1D in a controlled manner. Uh, this uh, relates to recent work by the Vishwanath group and us uh, with proposals in germanium selenide and other rectangular brave lattices where the idea is to use exploit anisotropy of the original monolayer to quench uh, uh, the kinetic energy scale in only one of the two spatial directions. However, one can also ask whether one can go in the opposite direction, namely uh, start from a two-dimensional uh, twisted heterostructure and really think about this as a building block to build a three-dimensional crystal. And with the advances in experimental composition of these heterostructures, this is now within reach and actually like, sort of simple examples of this have already been demonstrated. So one can ask whether one can take a twisted heterostructure as an ingredient and build a three-dimensional material 
that nevertheless allows for twist control of the complete three-dimensional band structure. So I'll talk about an example of this a little bit uh, with another recent proposal from the Dasarma group. Uh, finally, uh, one can ask about the intrinsic orbitals that arise in the Moray heterostructure as one twists at small twist angles. Uh, one can think about the effective low energy structure again to arise in terms of effective orbitals that form in the Moray supercell. And one can inquire whether a twist angle gives away to uh, uh, change the orbital anisotropy and composition of these orbitals to engineer some interesting effects. Uh, and finally, uh, but actually very interestingly, uh, so far the role of spin orbit coupling has pretty much been neglected uh, in the sense that uh, one missing ingredient of quenching the kinetic energy scale really is the possibility to potentially quench the kinetic energy scale in such a manner that the spin orbit coupling becomes the dominant energy scale at low energies. And that's a very exotic regime compared to a regular material, but has very interesting implications on the topology of the bands that arise and the role of correlate interplay of topology and correlations. Uh, so for the remainder of the talk, I'll give uh, uh, three examples on the right, namely I'll talk about the 2D to 3D crossover from a controlled stacking of heterostructures. I'll talk about orbital anisotropy that can arise in a very simple example in uh, twisted MOS2. And I'll talk about the role of spin orbit coupling in um, work that's currently in preparation for twisted uh, group four transition metal uh, diagonal talking mass. So to start, uh, Really, the basic premise is to ask whether one can use more heterostructures as uh, quantum simulators. And by that, we mean that uh, can we use a heterostructure, whether the fine control that the heterostructure allows, to engineer tailored states of matter? So, if the elementary question is the realization of various lattice models, which is hand wavingly shown in this uh, figure taken from a recent perspective article by uh, some of us at CCQ, as well as Columbia and uh, the Max Planck Institute. Uh, um, so one can think about engineering triangular or hexagonal lattice systems, but also rectangular lattices that ultimately give way to dim one dimensionality at certain twist angles. And one can then ask as a follow-up question whether uh, the particular orbital structure and this effectively engineered Moray lattice gives access to new states of matter, for instance, uh, quantum spin liquid behavior or un unconventional magnetism, unconventional superconductivity, excitons, uh, or uh, even extending such ideas to already intrinsically correlated monolayers and stacking them at a twist. So the first example that I'd like to give is uh, comes uh, for a twisted bilayer MOS2. Uh, so this work was done together with uh, Dominique Kiese, Michael Scherer, and Simon Trebs at the University of Cologne, and uh, later Sian and Angel Rubio at the Max Planck Institute, as well as Dante Kennis in Aachen. Uh, and in particular, this work is motivated by the observation that if we look at the untwisted bilayer of transition metal dichotogonites in the 2H uh, structural phase, so trigonal prismatic coordination, then there's actually two classes of untwisted bilayers. So on one hand, uh, one can have the situation where the valence band maximum uh, is lies at gamma with the valley valence band, with the second valence band maximum at K being at a significantly lower energy detuned from the gamma point. This is the case for MOS2 as well as MOSE2. Uh, and you could have the alternative case where the uh, valence band maximum is nearly degenerate with the gamma uh, valence at uh, the K point is nearly degenerate with the valence band maximum at the gamma point. That would be the case for tungsten dis uh, twisted tungsten diselenide. So in the former case, if the valence band maximum lies at the gamma point, and one now imagines going to very small twist angles. Uh, so this is a uh, recent work by us and also a proposal by Alan McDonald's group uh, just published this year. Um, uh, one can imagine uh, at very small twist angles that in fact the states at the uh, valleys should not really play a role for the low energy behavior at small twist angles at the top of the original valence band. So instead really the, uh, the highest Moray valence mini bands should be composed solely from the DC squared orbitals at the gamma point, which lends itself to an extremely simple picture. So we can think about this untwisted heterostructure and then stacking two, 
changing to a slight twist angle, which effectively engineers through the repeated misalignment of the two layers, the periodic misalignment of the two layers, to essentially asking about the combined dynamics of essentially a free electron gas uh, of uh, molybdenum uh, DZ squared orbitals in a long wavelength Moray potential that has the appropriate symmetries of the lattice. And in particular, if I'm looking at the very top of the uh, conduct valence band of MOS2, I will have almost a uh, perfect six-fold rotation symmetry, even though in the uh, twisted heterostructure, of course, my symmetry is reduced quite drastically. So I can really think of this problem as sort of a scalar potential uh, on top of a free electron gas. And that already gives us a route for doing more interesting things, because we could also ask, well, what happens when you have more bands and what happens when the potential is not scalar anymore, but you have a matrix valued or non-abelian potential. Uh, but let's first think about the scalar potential case. And in fact, this was uh, uh, proposed already quite a while ago in the context of cold atoms, where the realization really is just with the Moray potential being replaced by an optical lattice. So if I think about, uh, so this is a lattice regularization of really a continuum model, how the, ba the bands that arise under this long wavelength Moray potential, as I increase the potential strength, what I will find is that this potential essentially forms minima that form a honeycomb lattice in the plane. So uh, my, I will form orbitals or charge puddles that will be localized at the honeycomb sites of this uh, potential which forms a series of Moray mini bands, uh, notably at the top, just a regular honeycomb lattice of Moray S orbitals. But what's more interesting is if I go to stronger Moray potentials, I can ask about the subsequent next orbital sets of orbitals that form in these locations. And it turns out the next set of orbitals will be uh, uh, two orbitals of Px and Py character, again, localized at these uh, honeycomb lattice position minimas of your Moray super lattice potential. Uh, and this now constitutes essentially a PXPY honeycomb lattice model. However, uh, with the orbital anisotropy now being a function of the twist angle, which as I'll show in a second. And even more interestingly, if you go to even stronger Moray super lattice potentials, it turns out the next set of bands actually forms a Kagome lattice of Moray S orbitals at the shoulders of this. Can you see my mouse cursor? Okay, great. At the shoulders of this uh, of this potential here. Um, However, in practice, of course, this is just a toy continuum model to understand the effective physics. So we really need to ask using large scale Apinicia simulations that account for lattice relaxations, how realistic these effects are. And so in fact, uh, it's exactly what we did or particularly what, well, what later did using really uh, heroically large scale simulations with thousands of atoms in the unit cell to study uh, under full relaxation, how the Apinicia structure of such a large supercell looks like. Um, this is three representative twist angles for bilayer MOS2 at the uh, at a twist. And again, uh, in Abinitia, we see nicely this honeycomb lattice S orbital bands coming, arising at the top of the uh, uh, band gap, uh, with now the next set of bands becoming progressively more isolated as I go to lower twist angles and thereby essentially enhance uh, the role of the Moray potential giving me a second set of bands that form precisely this honeycomb lattice of px and py orbitals. So what does that mean in terms of an effective model? Now, these are, of course, MeV energy scales, or tens of, MeV ener tens of MeVs. So I can, in principle, gate tune uh, uh, such that uh, the chemical potential lies not in the topmost set of uh, s orbitals, but instead the px py orbitals. And if I constrain myself only to that band, uh, a simple anisotropic PX and PY model can be fitted to the ab initio structure and gives the interesting result that actually, so uh, the nearest neighbor type binding model will just be parametrized by pi and sigma hopping between the P orbitals. And the relative magnitude of pi and sigma orbitals, which correspond to the essentially or shape of the Moray orbitals, is a function of sigma hopping, uh, of twist angle, becoming progressively more anisotropic as I decrease the twist angle in addition to the bandwidth. So this inset here is the ratio of pi hopping versus sigma hopping, decreasing as a function of twist angle, whereas the outer subplot is the bandwidth of the uh, set of bands, which is also reduced due to quenching of the kinetic energy scales. So this gives a route for two things. So first, I can tune the anisotropy. And second, the peculiarity about this 
PXPY model in the anisotropic limit is the emergence of an almost perfectly dispersionless band, which now doesn't arise due to a magic angle condition, but instead really arises due to kinetic interference, very similar to a flat band in a cargo lattice or a leap lattice. So this manifests itself in terms of the peak in the density of states, and we can already expect that correlated uh, the role of electron interactions will be prominent as we dope into these bands. So let's just briefly chat about uh, the uh, 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 interacting phases that this model permits. So uh, calculation of interaction parameters, unfortunately, is out of uh, reach for ab initio simulations with thousands of atoms in the unit cell. In principle, one should be scaling things like constrained RPA with recent uh, efforts in theoretical groups listed here. Uh, instead, we'll take the perspective that we'll just take a local interacting model of hubbard Kanomori type uh, and treat our interaction parameters as free parameters. So the, uh, in particular, we'll focus on the quarter field case, since this is a two orbital model, uh, spin orbital physics at strong interactions might be quite interesting. So at quarter filling, it turns out as a function of U already for uh, uh, one finds an interaction induced metal in leader transition with the charge degrees of freedom becoming inert for U greater than uh, U or T greater than four. Um, so if that is the case, we can ask, well, uh, can we devise an effective model for the low energy spin and orbital uh, dynamics? Where at quarter filling now we have both the spin of our electrons plus the orbital px or py component, which just amounts to essentially a twist tunable anisotropic Kubo Komsky model. So this physics is in principle very similar to the case of twisted bilayer graphene, where you also have a px-py model. However, now with the crucial difference that the anisotropy, i.e., the, the ratio of sigma and pi hopping, which manifests itself in anisotropy in the Kubo Komsky model, is now a function of twist angle. And then the right is uh, a uh, phase, phase diagram calculated in mean field theory, showing a variety of uh, antiferromagnetic uh, uh, phases with uh, pneumatic orbital orders, with ferroorbital or antiferroorbital pneumatic, pneumatic order as a function of interaction parameters. Um, Martin, can I ask a question? Yep. This Lucas. Um, just a just. Why are there no like longer range density density interactions? Is there a reason you can rule them out? Or as far as I know, in TBG, they are, they are quite significant or they're quite important, right? So, so, that's, so that's an approximation. So uh, first, uh, would something uh, change in these phase diagrams? Or you know, do you expect something significant to change significantly? So if you, uh, so there is a two step procedure here. So first, uh, Longer ranged interactions uh, are dropped here out of uh, simplicity because we don't know how to calculate these interaction parameters. But that being said, sure. of yeah. course, the distance between the Moray orbitals is very large at uh, small twist angles, such that one could imagine that these interactions might uh, <clears throat> can be suppressed at very small twist angles. Now you could ask about you know how how well is the bare inter interaction screened. Uh, and this is really a question that would have to be solved in constrained RPA calculations. However, uh, could, you remind, this this in, in, could you remind me how this in twisted bilayer graphene is, have people looked at like next nearest neighbor density density and so on? Is, so twisted bilayer is graphene is a little more, is a little uh, trickier because of the shape of the orbitals. So this relates okay. also to the topological obstruction that the model, uh, that the model mm -hmm. has. So this is not the case here since you started. Okay, 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 yeah. That makes much more sense now, okay, yeah. But actually, yeah, that, that's an important point. Yeah. Um, I also have so, a question, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's like, uh, since this is a honeycomb lattice and it has some uh, anisotropy, so uh, could we relate it to some spin liquid phase like the k spin liquid? Uh, so, if it's related to a Kitaev spin, so, so first of all, this is uh, this analysis here is for the quarter field case for a spin orbital model. So you could uh, to get a spin uh, to get a Kitaev like spin liquid phase, or at least the simplest realizations, you would want a spin one half moment. However, you need bond uh, dependent, highly anisotropic easing like interactions, which means you need a strong spin orbit coupling component. And MOS2, while in principle, let me just go back here, MOS2, oh, too far. MOS2, 
does have strong spin orbit coupling at, but it does have strong spin orbit coupling at the k point. So the twisted states are dominated by the gamma point, which by symmetry doesn't have spin, has no spin orbit coupling because it's just a dz squared orbital with a strong uh, detuning to the lower lying bands of different character. So actually, spin orbit coupling in this compound doesn't play a role. Um, but I'll I'll show in a second an example where spin orbit coupling becomes very important. Uh, Furthermore, actually, to realize Kitaev-like physics, uh, you know, to get, a, get this bond dependence, really what you'd want is something analogous to sort of a T2G3 orbital uh, model instead of a PXPY model. Thank you. Oh, and ju just uh, for Lucas's question, yeah, so, uh, so of course, we've neglected longer range interactions, and uh, there's um, partially because we don't have to deal with the topological obstruction that graphene has. But in principle, at, as the charge gap opens uh, at, a, at a given uh, local Coulomb repulsion, uh, the kugel komsky physics uh, will likely be, so essentially this will just be a small modification of the effective kugel komsky exchange parameters, which are not shown here as a function of long range interactions. Um, okay, so, uh, actually, now going forward regarding spin orbit coupling. Uh, so, all of these considerations really regarded uh, group six TMDs. So, this regarded twisted MOS2, but in principle also MOSE2 or tungsten disulfide. Um, however, uh, one can also ask uh, whether one could play similar games with other TMDs. And very prominently, one could look at the group four TMDs, such as twisted zirconium disulfide or twisted hafnium disulfide. Uh, which in the monolayer and in the untwisted bilayer are already pretty well characterized, but which have the important difference that while the group six TMDs naturally want to crystallize in the 2H phase, so it's trigonal tri prismatic distortion uh, coordination, uh, group four TMDs uh, can crystallize in a 1T phase with octahedral coordination. And I'll show how actually this means that spin orbit coupling really uh, plays a central role in these considerations. So uh, this work is again with uh, Leda, Dante, and Anja. Uh, and really the premise is to look at the 1T structure of a zirconium disulfide monolayer and note that the valence band maximum, so this is again a semiconductor uh, of like an EV and something of a band gap. And the valence band maximum is now not composed of a DZ squared transition metal orbital, but instead uh, the PX and PY orbitals of sulfur of uh, uh, of the van der Waals layer. Uh, and notably, in the absence of spin orbit coupling, these two orbitals would be degenerate. However, strong spin orbit coupling already in the monolayer now breaks this degeneracy uh, and introduces a finite spin orbit coupling at the gamma point. So now we could think about the same situation and ask well, what if I take, so this is the bilayer band structure actually without twist. If I now impose a small twist angle, Again, I would expect that since this is half an EV detuning to the next uh, valence band, like uh, second valence band maximum here, that at small twist angles, all physics will be dominated by the PXPY orbitals plus spin orbit coupling at the gamma point. However, the situation is now a little more involved because I have not one, but uh, two orbitals. Um, so if I want to build in the Moray supercell, uh, so this is just showing the different alignments of the two layers across a uh, uh, commensurate supercell. Um, if I again want to build an effective continuum model to describe uh, the effective Moray bands that are, emerge from treating the electrons here as essentially free electrons, but now with a two orbital PXPY character plus a Moray superpotential, I have to be very careful because first, I have to make sure to properly account for the PXPY character in the kinetic term. However, the, crucially, the uh, Moray potential will now not be a scalar, but will be a matrix value potential. And finally, I should expect a, uh, an uh, L dot S like spin orbit term that will, as we'll see, will dominate at low energies. Particularly this matrix value spin Moray potential, again, using the same considerations as in MOS2, if I look at the very top of the valence band, my bands will, uh, even though, of course, the heterostructure is chiral, uh, 
the highest bands will be almost uh, C6 and symmetric with uh, mirror symmetry, which poses strong constraints from these symmetries on the form of the Mori potential. In fact, one can show that this Mori potential really only has two free parameters, namely a scalar potential, just like before, plus a matrix valued potential term that admixes the px and py orders. So taken together, what does that mean for the low energy structure at the top of the original valence band? So again, I can first ask, well, what happens if I just consider the scalar potential and ignore spin orbit coupling for now? So my px, py orbitals are degenerate at the gamma point. Um, so a very small twist angle, so this is just a folded uh, supercell. Um, and as I increase the value of the scalar potential, I progressively, again, localize electrons at the, uh, at the uh, uh, minima of the honeycomb lattice and the super lattice potential. However, now not with S orbital character, but again with PXPY orbital character, since I started with PXPY orbitals. So there won't be an S orbital honeycomb lattice, unlike MOS2. Instead, the highest set of valence bands is now of PXPY character on the honeycomb lattice, again, giving this a uh, four band dispersion with a quasi quasi flat band. However, that ignores uh, the matrix value part of the potential. Uh, and if I look at the orbital character, uh, so th th these are density plots at the gamma point of the charge density distribution in the supercell. So the top two bands are just, those are, or the top four bands are just localized at the honeycomb science in the Mori super lattice potential. But if I look at the fifth band from the top, I already find that actually this fifth band has Kagome characters instead localized at the shoulders of the original Mori potential. So now we can ask, well, actually, does this give us an angle to make the, these bands become the dominant bands uh, and push them to higher energy? And indeed, that's exactly what the matrix valued component of the Mori potential does. So now if I think about starting with a scalar potential uh, and increasing the magnitude of the matrix value potential, now as I increase, I shift the up the Kagoma band, shift down the lowest band of the four PXPY bands, and finally emerge with a, a well-resolved, separate, energetically separated structure of three Kagoma bands, which are now localized, which are S orbital-like and localized on uh, the Kagoma sides in this effective Maurice uh, triangular lattice structure, uh, and are energetically isolated from all lower lying bands as I go to very small twist angles, hence larger Mori super lattice potential. Now, to compare this with Avinicio results, uh, this is again large scale, extremely hard, difficult to compute Avinicio results for thousands of atoms in a supercell going from three degrees down to 2.28 degrees as the max maximum we can reach without spin orbit coupling. And you see precisely this pattern. So at large angles, you have this flat band at the top that originates from the PX, PY bands. And as you decrease the uh, uh, twist angle, gradually a set of Kagome bands emerges to the top that unfortunately for the twist angles that we can reach is still uh, not fully separated from lower lying uh, uh, bands in the super lattice. However, we also observe again uh, effectively linear scaling of the total bandwidth of these Kagome events uh, with twist lowering twist angle, as well as uh, band separation to other bands. So, just to show how the charge density for this looks like, to see that this is actually a Kagome lattice, again at the gamma point, we find precisely for these bands and these bands, so this is shown for 2.64 degrees, a Kagome structure of charge density. Uh, and with the intervening bands having sort of a ring-shaped uh, charge density structure that is uh, localized in the center of the hexagons of the Kagome lattice, uh, which should be sh shifted to lower energies. In fact, we can model this behavior just very simply from our uh, continuum model, which shows precisely the same physics at weaker Mori potential, where you form a Kagome lattice that is not fully separated from these uh, uh, ring-shaped orbitals that are localized at the center of the hexagons. Um, so now this ignored spin-orbit coupling, but the role of spin-orbit coupling is very simple to see. So this will just, uh, by symmetry, uh, necessarily break the degeneracy at, that's at the Dirac points and the Kagome structure at K, as well as lift the degeneracy at the gamma point between the flat band and the dispersive Kagome band, leaving three energetically isolated bands here shown for twist angle 2.45. Actually, sorry, these twist angles are not the same 
Uh, this is the lowest twist angle we can get for spin orbit coupling, which is a slightly more expensive calculation. Giving energetically isolated bands uh, with now spin orbit coupling really becoming the dominant energy scale. So all of this, the, the gap between these bands is set purely by the strength of the L.S. local spin orbit scale, which now competes with the quenched kinetic energy scale and hence really becomes the dominant contribution for the highest more A bands at low uh, small. Uh, twist angles. So two things that are important about this. First, these bands are topologically non-trivial. Those are actually spin churn bands. And really this gives us a route towards tuning into the ultra strong spin orbit coupling regime, where the dominant scale becomes spin orbit coupling. To see the topology, let's uh, try and devise an effective model for the cargo mid lattice. Um, so essentially, this just amounts to building a tight binding model for orbitals localized at these sites here and uh, uh, these charge puddles. Uh, and the minimal model amounts to having nearest neighbor hopping, which is both real and has an imaginary part, which comes from spin orbit coupling, as well as to properly um, uh, fit uh, the low energy band structure. You also need to account second and third nearest neighbor hopping. And already, uh, uh, foreshadowing what we're going to do, we're also going to ask, well, now what happens when you add interactions, namely, in the simplest case, just a local Coulomb repulsion plus a nearest neighbor Coulomb repulsion. So the salient things are this model models a time reversal invariant flat band quantum spin hall insulator. Uh, the bandwidth is again twist tunable, and in particular, the spin orbit coupling. So this is just from the fitted uh, points for the angles that we simulated in ab initio. This is the ratio of spin orbit coupling over the nearest neighbor kinetic hopping, which is the largest kinetic energy scale. As one decreases the twist angle, uh, this uh, one increases this ratio, providing uh, monotonic tuning into, well, not quite monotonic tuning, but into the strong spin orbit coupling regime. Um, so, uh, why is this interesting? Well, as these bands are now substantially separated energetically, we can think about gating such a device such that the chemical potential is shifted into the topmost uh, moray, almost flat band that emerges from this Kagome structure after spin orbit coupling, with the band gap here set by spin orbit coupling. Uh, and if this band gap is large enough, um, then the lower lying bands will re effectively remain inert. So these bands will be fully filled. And we'll, we can really inquire about the role of interactions in the partially filled topologically non-trivial time reversal invariant band as a function of filling fraction tunable via gating. Uh, so these bands have a spin churn number plus minus one, the top band and the bottom band in the cargo mid lattice actually with the middle band being trivial. And uh, this lends itself to a very neat analogy to a simple picture with Landau levels. So if this is a topological band, which is almost flat, and has a non-zero spin churn number that is essentially analogous to asking about a model of Landau levels for spinful electrons now, where the direction of the magnetic field is uh, reversed for the two spin components, hence preserving overall time reversal symmetry. So actually, uh, this was first proposed by, uh, should, uh, studying problems like this was first proposed by uh, uh, Shuqing Chung's group at Stanford. Uh, where now the idea is if the cyclotron frequency is large enough with the cyclotron frequency in our picture being the energetic separation to the other bands, then electrons will be confined to uh, topologic uh, to Landau levels, uh, which amount to a germ number equals one band with equal and opposite chirality for the two spin orientations. So we can, uh, armed with this, we can study this problem quite analogous to how one studies fractional quantum hall physics. Namely, a minimal model should just consider the topmost band of fractional filling and ignore the inert bands, which amounts to a lowest Landau level like projection, but now for, uh, for, for spin churn bands. Effectively ending up with one a weakly dispersing band. Uh, this is now the dispersion of the topmost Kagome band plus a projected interaction that accounts for all of the effects of topology. Uh, through uh, a projection in terms of the Bloch wave functions given with orbital indices alpha here. Uh, notably, uh, since all of the topology is encoded in the interaction, uh, uh, the fact that the spin term number is non-trivial uh, 
means that uh, there is a topological obstruction to forming a simple tight binding model like description of the interacting physics. This is a Vani obstruction to the formation of localized orbitals. So if I wanted to represent interactions in this band in a real space picture, my interaction would necessarily be long range because the orbitals that I would have to form would be would not be able to be localized exponentially instead would have a power law day leading to long range interactions. That's analogous to the essence of a Lana level preventing a localized uh, crystalline basis. So now uh, let's first think about the half filled case in the system. So if I fill the spin turn bend at half filling and the dispersion is sufficiently weak at small twist angles, then essentially uh, what we find is a ferromagnetic instability as the local Coulomb repulsion, or actually interestingly also parametrized by nearest neighbor Coulomb repulsion here as an additional parameter, reaches order of the electronic bandwidth of this topmost band. So this is really somewhat analogous to uh, flat band ferromagnetism originally proposed by Milk and Tasaki, or also quantum hall ferromagnetism in multi-component quantum, quantum hall systems at commensurate filling. Uh, and in particular, we find that uh, as one exceeds a critical interaction strength, which amounts to the bandwidth of the topmost band, one spin polarizes the electrons, which amounts to filling one of the two term bands and gives a correlation induced uh, quantum anomalous Hall effect, which is a gapped system with a gap that again scales with uh, the strength of the interactions. Now it's very useful to compare this to the case of twisted bilayer graphene because we now have uh, experimental observations from numerous groups for a quantum anomalous Hall effect in TBG. However, the uh, quantum anomalous Hall effect there is much more involved in the sense that uh, it doesn't happen at half filling. Instead, you have to go to a new uh, three filling fraction with new equals four being fully filled. And the quantum anomalous Hall effect then really arises from a subtle interplay of the fact that the valleys are topologically non-trivial or well you can assign a valley term number to each of the valleys and interactions drive the system into a spin and valley polarized phase triggering a transition to a quantum anomalous hollow insulator so that's uh, one of the uh, current uh, one of the expected theories of this effect here the systematics is significantly simpler and really relies on flat band ferromagnetism. So we're at commensurate filling, in particular half filling. In principle, one can also imagine something similar happen at quarter filling. Uh, and uh, essentially, the transition to the quantum anomalous Hall insulator uh, uh, amounts to interactions exceeding the bandwidth analogous to a mod transition, where the system uh, can sp spontaneously lower its energy just by completely polarizing its spins and thereby paying zero interaction penalty due to a local Hubbard interaction, which gives you a penalty for having a spin up and spin down. Uh, uh, so uh, this really is a much simpler mechanism of creating an interaction induced uh, ferromagnetic topologically non-trivial state. So. Uh, mm -hmm. A natural follow-up question to ask is, well, what happens if one goes away from half filling and goes to fractional filling? So this question of fractional topological insulators or more precisely fractional churn insulators as the sort of fractional quantum hall analogy in lattices with non-trivial churn number to a fractional quantum hall effect in the Landau level uh, already has a number of proposals in the context of TBG, in particular, twisted bilayer graphene, but also heterostructures of twisted HPN on trilayer graphene or double bilayer graphene, where the idea now is to, to essentially make an assumption that if uh, the spin valley polarization persists as one dopes away uh, from commensurate filling, uh, then at fractional filling of the resulting churn bands, uh, if uh, the interplay of interactions allows, one can think about condensing into a uh, abelian laughlin like state or even uh, high order composite fermion like states. The basic idea is, uh, or the basic understanding of this really comes about from a mutatis mutandis mapping between a quasi flat band with non zero term number and a, uh, and a Landau level. But the key obstacle is that the spin valley polarization mod persists at fractional filling. So, uh, zirconium disulfide in this sense is. Uh, very useful alternative in the sense that uh, the ferromagnetic state uh, arises not from spin valley polarization, 
but just from uh, uh, the fact that in any flat band for sufficiently strong interactions, you will uh, form a ferromagnetic state, uh, giving you an easier route to realize an isolated churn band. So to assess how this works uh, in a little more detail, uh, we looked at uh, the fractional quantum Hall effect at one sixth overall filling, which corresponds under sp after spontaneous time reversal symmetry breaking to one third uh, filling fraction for spin polarized electrons. So on the left is shown a plot of magnetization as a function of local Coulomb repulsion U and nearest neighbor Coulomb repulsion U prime uh, showing just the magnetization. And one finds even at fractional, so at this fractional filling away from commensurability, uh, Again, for local Coulomb repulsion on the order of the electronic bandwidth, one finds a transition to a spontaneously spin polarized uh, ferromagnetic state. Uh, so this is a robust ferromagnetic transition for U greater than the electronic bandwidth. However, now if this electrons are fully spin polarized, uh, any uh, organization of the spin polarized electrons must necessarily come about from an interplay of the dispersion that is of course not zero and longer range interaction. So that's where the role of U prime, the nearest neighbor interaction comes in. And it turns out that as one increases U prime beyond the critical value of U prime, one finds a transition to an incompressible state, uh, which obeys, so this is a simulation and exact diagonalization parameterized in terms of uh, total crystal momentum versus energy of individual lowest lying excitations above the ground state giving beyond the critical interaction strength exactly a threefold ground state degeneracy that's expected for a new equals one third Laughlin state. And in fact, we can probe this in a, little, a little more carefully, for instance, by uh, asking about the flow of the ground state degeneracy under flux insertion through uh, handles of the torus in periodic boundary conditions, matching in addition to the momentum counting following a, sort of a generalized poly principle for fractional churn insulators, exactly what is expected for a new equals one third Laughlin state uh, from now a strong nearest neighbor interaction. So actually how much, how much time, how long is this? Uh, how much time do we have left? Well, you started at 1130, I mean, or later. So at least 1230, but we've also blocked it till one. So at least 10 minutes, but if you wanna go longer then go longer. Okay, perfect. So then I'll briefly chat uh, I'll briefly discuss sort of the last point uh, of ex trying to extend heterostructure engineering beyond two dimensions. And the basic idea uh, is now that if we can take twist angles between successive layers, uh, can we use a similar idea to engineer dispersions out of plane? Now, naively, if I just think about a chirally twisted structure, uh, I will naively break Bloch's theorem uh, such that I can define a simple commensurate supercell anymore. Instead, a very simple generalization of twisting to three dimensions is thinking about uh, twisted sets of layers that one progressively stacks on top of each other. The simplest realization of this is shown here. Uh, so let's just think about sets of two twisted layers that are at a small twist angle and just stack them on top of each other to form a three dimensional material. So now if I consider the single twisted layer, set of uh, single twisted bilayer and think about where my charge density is localized. So this will be forming some lattice of puddles of charge density, say a honeycomb lattice or a Kagome lattice. And I start, stack these layers on top of each other. Um, now twisting will progressively quench the dispersion in the plane. So these are, this is this essentially flattened line uh, given by example here uh, for, uh, for HBN. Uh, however, in the third dimension, these charge puddles essentially align in the out of plane direction, still allowing electrons to pop uh, with uh, un basically unchanged magnitude out of plane, uh, leaving significant dispersion in the out of plane direction. So really this scenario we can think about as a 3D generalization of a wire model of twist tunable in plane band flattening However, still having a remaining dispersion on the Z direction, which is interesting in itself, but does not amount to twist control over all three directions. So an alternative, of course, would be to just introduce spacer layers between subsequent layers. So think about pairs of twisted layers, then introduce a spacer layer, add another pair of twisted layers, 
this will progressively quench uh, the out of plane dispersion and certainly uh, eventually lead to, lead to a band that is flat in all three dimensions by virtue of being, of being decoupled in the third dimension. However, a caveat for our purposes is that this really does not afford twist angle control of the third dimension. So this is instead a, a materials composition control of adjusting the number of spacer layers and also comes with uh, difficulties of aligning uh, the pairs of twisted layers across uh, the spacer layer uh, to form an aligned stack of uh, three-dimensional uh, twisted layers. So uh, the third scenario that we can think of is, uh, for, for lack of a better word, a twist on the previous uh, examples. Uh, we can think about taking our fundamental cell not to be mo uh, single monolayers that we stack on the twist, but instead twisted bilayers. So now what happens with twisted bilayers is that if I orient my two layers in such a way that the natural stacking is sort of at a twist from say AB Bernal stacking or graphene, then I can geometrically engineer my stack of 3D twisting in such a way that the charge puddles in my twisted bilayers are going to be localized on two uh, sides, for instance, the two honeycomb sides of the lattice, in, but with the two honeycomb sides being localized in the different in different layers of subsequent uh, of, of the two bilayers which form my elementary cell, um, such that if I now combine sort of sets of these bilayers at, at a twist, um, I progressive I get strong coupling uh, between these charge puddles. But the distance between neighboring charge puddles across the stacks will now be a function of twist angle, uh, as well as the in-plane dispersion will be a function of twist angle, giving me an angle to, well, again, for lack of a better word, by twisting, uh, by changing the twist angle to change not only the in-plane dispersion, but also by virtue of separating uh, subsequent uh, locations of the charge puddles to quench the out of plane, the, uh, uh, the out of plane hopping, really giving twist angle control of dispersion in all three dimensions. So, so from this very simple picture, how this works in practice is uh, shown here by the example of uh, twisted hexagonal boron nitride as, uh, well, as a well controlled example of these ideas. But really I wanna emphasize that this strategy is in principle very generic. So this could be done with any possible van der Waals material, which uh, allows for uh, composing subsequent stacks of bilayers at a twist uh, with charge puddles being placed at inequivalent sites in the, in the, in the plane. So uh, the effective low energy physics is shown here uh, with the bands on the right as a function of decreasing twist angle essentially being composed again of these charge puddles, which now form a honeycomb lattice in the plane. However, with the two sides of the honeycomb lattice being in different layers of my pairs of layers. So this amounts to uh, <clears throat> first being able to use twist angle to quench uh, in-plane hoppings T1 and T2 as a function of uh, changing the supercell side and moving these charge puddles away from each other. And finally, also allowing uh, changing of the out of plane uh, T3 dispersion that gives me hopping between the layers since these charge puddles are now spatially separated uh, between uh, alternating layers. Giving a way of, so this is the band structure with the in plane uh, direction being shown from the center axis gamma to gamma here and the out of plane here, giving a way by reducing twist angle to progressively quench all three uh, uh, directions of the band structure simultaneously. In this case, again, forming a honeycomb lattice of these charge puddles with the third direction being quenched simultaneously with the in-plane direction. Um, so these are again, uh, ab initio simulations for the periodic structure at commensurate uh, angles. Uh, and I think an easy way to see the effective physics is this top-down view here, which just shows where the charge puddles are localized. From the top-down view, they form a honeycomb lattice. From the side view, however, you see that inequivalent sites in the honeycomb unit cell occupy different layers, giving rise to the out of plane uh, twist control of the dispersion. So, <clears throat> armed with this band structure, um, we can uh, say, ask sort of the natural follow up question, presuming that we can dope 
into uh, these uh, into these twisted flat bands, which of course in the three dimensional case is a different challenge than the two dimensional case and skating doesn't readily uh, translate, but one can think about chemical doping. Then we can ask about now instabilities, not in the two dimensional flat band, but in the three in the full three dimensional uh, uh, twist controlled, uh, almost dispersionless band. So to see this first, the top is showing uh, a set of magnetic instabilities calculated in random phase approximation via tuning of the chemical potential in the honeycomb lattice bands. So as a function of filling, half filling again, since this is an approximately bipartite lattice, uh, given our uh, fitting of the ab initio data, one gets the usual anti-ferromagnetic order. Now in the random phase approximation, as one goes away from half filling and one goes to an almost uh, filled band, one gets the ferromagnetic instability at dilute electron or hole doping. Whereas in the intervening regions for finite filling, however, for a pretty large critical U, one finds competing uh, spin density wave instabilities at finite uh, 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 ordering vector Q, which is shown schematically here on the right, giving uh, rise to a variety of different uh, Magnetically, magnetic ordering patterns. So the more interesting thing actually is since these instabilities are at a pretty large critical U, we can ask about, well, what happens at lower U where fluctuations of uh, the magnetic order can still dress your effective interactions and give rise to an effective superconducting instability from originally repulsive interactions. So this is shown on the bottom here for a very, uh, small doping of, of a few MeV away from half filling from the antiferromagnetic phase, uh, showing still almost perfectly nested Fermi surfaces in the third dimension, uh, leading to large uh, spin fluctuations with uh, uh, wave vector Q alpha, uh, which now under studying the superconducting instabilities of the effective fluctuation uh, renormalized interaction vertex, Gives rise can trigger competing instabilities in the D wave, uh, P wave, or F wave channel. And in fact, we find a dominant instability in the DXC and DYZ uh, channel, which are degenerate under the threefold rotation symmetry of the lattice. And uh, hence, via a simple Ginsburg Landau analysis, in fact, forms a time reversal symmetry breaking superconducting instability, analogous to what's been proposed by some groups for twisted bivariate graphene in two dimensions. So I should say this is not a topological superconductor since this is still nodal in the z direction. However, is a time reversal super, uh, is a time reversal breaking superconducting state. Um, so okay, so now. Um, so I'm pretty much running to the wire. This brings me to the end of this talk. So just as a brief summary, uh, the basic premise of what we've tried to do is we've tried to start from very simple toy models of asking about uh, different types of heterostructure compositions and inquiring as one goes to small twist angles away from commensurate uh, configurations how engineering of the Maurice super lattice potentials gives a new route to engineering unconventional states of matter. So in the simplest case of a scalar potential, we've seen that for twisted bilayer MOS2, one can get a twist tunable anisotropic PXPY Hubbard model with interesting spin orbital physics. Um, however, uh, as one goes to uh, the group four transition metal uh, diculturbinate, such as zirconium disulfide, one finds that this actually has to be extended from a scalar to a matrix valued Mori potential, which gives rise to new physics in particular, gives the ability to tune into an ultra strong spin over coupling regime, where really spin over coupling dominates the low energy dynamics and combined with strong electronic interactions, if the band is flattened enough, uh, can host a variety of correlated and topological states, in particular an interaction driven quantum anomalous Hall insulator and various states at fractional uh, filling corresponding, for instance, to fractional quantum Hall states on a lattice. And finally, uh, going into the third dimension via engineering uh, the location of the charge puddles via the Mori superpotential in such a manner that the charge puddles are not aligned between subsequent layers, this really gives twist control over the third dimension as well, sort of completing uh, twist control of one dimensional, two dimensional, and three dimensional systems. So just a few comments on this, I think uh, on one hand, it's even more interesting maybe to look at compounds such as hafnium disulfide, which has even stronger uh, spin orbit coupling uh, and has already been 
is, has, has already been uh, studied by various groups in the untwisted mono and bilayers. However, also our study really focused on time reversal symmetry, symmetry breaking uh, instabilities away from half filling in uh, a partially filled quantum spin hall band. However, and related a very interesting question that attracted a lot of attention a couple of years ago uh, was uh, the question whether you would actually have time reversal invariant correlated seats of matter, sort of a fractionalized generalization of a fractional topological insulator. So in a sense, uh, twisted heterostructures in the 1T coordination provide an ideal playground to try and search for uh, uh, time reversal, physics of time reversal invariant topological correlated states of matter. So um, let me just briefly acknowledge my collaborators. So first of all, uh, Leda Sian, who's been doing tremendously difficult uh, calculations of uh, and ab initio characterizations of large super, super cell structures. Um, and Dante Kenneth, uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, as well as uh, Amon Fischer, Fischer at Aachen, who've uh, uh, worked out the superconducting instabilities of uh, the uh, three-dimensional stacking order and have uh, uh, done the theoretic have done a lot of the theoretical theoretical modeling uh, together with with Angel and me that's been shown on this work, as well as Dominic Kiese, Michael Schere, and Simon Trebs who have done the mean field analysis on uh, twisted MOS2 and shown the variety of uh, spin orbital orders that this can arrange, as well as also uh, Jin Zhang at uh, the Max Planck Institute. Uh, it's been working on uh, uh, the three-dimensional twistronics. So thanks, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, Great, thanks Martin, that was, a lot that was super interesting. <laughs> um, I, well, I'm sure other people have questions. I have first some simple question, which is um, in, go, so going back to the zirconium um, sulfide, uh, one of the questions I have about these 2D models is when do you know whether you should just include a potential or when should you include interlayer hopping? Like interlayer tunneling. Yeah, so uh, the picture advocated here is we're not, you know, the, the basic band, uh, the basic orbitals that we pick uh, here. Oh, no, sorry. Here we go. So the basic orbitals we pick are actually not orbitals that arise in the untwisted monolayer, but in the bilayer. So essentially, you should view this potential construction as something akin to like a, 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 a k dot p expansion around the gamma point in the presence of a uh, spatial alignment that changes where the alignment of orbitals between subsequent layers change uh, as you move across the supercell. So essentially in principle, so we haven't, we haven't done this directly from up initio. In fact, uh, Alan McDonald's group has done a similar study for MOS2. Uh, with an ab initio parameterization of the super potential. You can really extract from looking at sort of the local energetics of the different local static stacking configuration, what that super potential looks like. So essentially the bilayer structure is already en encompassed in the fact that these orbitals here are really the uh, lowest energy valence band orbitals of the bilayer, not the monolayer. Ah, I see. So I see. So instead of thinking of two layers with a twist angle, you're thinking of a bi. Okay, I, I, I think I see. I, I think of an untwisted bilayer, and then ask, well, what happens if I, you know, shift my? If I think about a spatial shift of the two layers with respect mm -hmm. to each other, which generates a potential. Um, hi, my team. Um, very interesting talk. Um, I have two questions. One is related to the uh, one third Lofton state. The one is related to the Moray. So maybe uh, let me first ask the one third Lofton state. Mm -hmm. So um, I think in realizing the fractional quantum states, you need a spin value polarized band um, first, as you mentioned. Right? Can you remind me why um, why you increase the U prime, which the next nearest neighbor induction will give you such spin 
value per I spend. Maybe also you already mentioned, but can you remind me the argument here? Oh, sorry, why increasing U prime? Um, yeah. Right, so I mean, for the Laughlin, for the Laughlin, so fundamentally actually you already see this in the half field case. So the half field case, so for increase, actually one of the more interesting uh, uh, consequences is that, okay, naively, so if I increase U, at some point, you know, my electrons can gain energy from just spin polarizing and hence paying no energy penalty U. So this flat band ferromagnetism for a local Hubbard interaction is well established. Uh, and uh, just after critical U that exceeds the bandwidth gives uh, full polarization. However, you see here that also, well, so by the way, the top line is not zero U, it's finite, it's a small but finite U to be fair. Uh, but as you increase U prime, you also find that you get a transition to a fully polarized state as a, at a critical U prime. And sort of the underlying physics really is that of a topological Vanier obstruction. Yeah, so charge wants to localize because of strong Coulomb repulsion. So it wants to stop moving because the Coulomb repulsion will you know, try and pack the charge in a particular pattern. However, the Vanier obstruction entails that these uh, charge puddles can't be forming a localized sort of a set of localized lattice orbitals. Uh, so the only way to circumvent this sort of in a hand waving way is to break the underlying symmetry, which in this case is time reversal symmetry corresponding or well, since it's a quantum spin hall insulating state, actually uh, also the, the U1 spin rotate, uh, you want to spin polarize. Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, the uh, so 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 sort of that's so that's the intuitive picture of coming from a Vanier obstruction. Uh, now, if you're at a finite filling, can I ask a increase... question about what you just said though? Because um, the quantum anomalous hall also has uh, a Vanier obstruction, right? So that doesn't really help you localize charge, does it? That, that that's that's right that's right so the, the charge is well the charge is only localized because uh you're essentially packing it into one band right you're packing it into one of the spin bands which is fully filled okay so it's still more localized than in the half filled spin churn case you're saying even though it's not well so in the in the fully in the in the fully filled band it's localized just because it can move like you're you're fully you're fill, fully filling a band, mm -hmm. so that's the, the only way that's the only way for the system to localize its charges. If uh, you had carriers in both the spin bands, um, since uh, the fundamental orbitals uh, that your interaction projects into are not localized, the system cannot just localize, say, spin up and spin down carriers by forming, say, regular patterns of spin ups and spin downs. So the regular picture of a local moment formation is the work. When you polarize all your electrons into one uh, species of electrons, you're just forming a filled band. So the electrons are the electrons are immobile. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, however, uh, for the Laughlin state, you can also think that you know at some point as you increase U prime. Uh, it just becomes energetically favorable for the system to open up a gap uh, via avoiding uh, uh, via avoiding uh, electrons being in uh, relative uh, angular momentum states of low relative angular momentum, just like uh, the pseudo potential picture of the Laughlin state in the Landau level, and that opening up of a gap saves energy uh, and. Mm -hmm. And that energy saving will can cause the system to simultaneously spread time reversal symmetry to open up this gap. Yeah. So, yeah. Should I think of this formation of that Laplace state as two steps? The first is that when I increase the U prime, um, uh, I get a spin polarized band, and then U prime gives uh, me a short range interaction that gives me a Laplace state. Right. It, That's right. That so as I as I increase my u, yeah, you can think of this exactly. So as you right. as you have a finite u, yeah. essentially yeah. u causes the system to spin polarize. Right. And as the system is spin polarized, u drops out as an energy scale. Yeah. So I understand the energy scale is u prime that really dictates whether you can form an incompressible state. 
Okay, so I understand that the second step, your prime give me a lock plane state, but uh, um, what is the mechanism that your prime can lead to a spin polarized phase? But wait, you or U prime? U prime, U prime yeah, in the y axis. Ah, uh, you mean, right? So there's, there's two ways, right? So this, if you go in the horizontal direction, mm -hmm. you will favor spin polarization because the system can just. Okay. Eliminate its right. energy penalty U by uh, putting all electrons in one spin configuration. Right. If you just if you keep U uh, vanishingly small and just increase U prime, at some point uh, you can imagine that uh, you know as you are if you're think, thinking about the fractional quantum Hall state, the excitation gap above the ground state sort of the lowering of energy uh, relates to uh, U prime. So as you increase U prime very much. At some point, it's energetically favorable for the electrons to both sort of simultaneously spin polarize and condense into a Laughlin state. So, it, uh, since this is a one step direction and this is a two step where you first polarize and then you uh, uh, condense into a okay. in the mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, thanks. So, my second question is about more So, we know that in twisted value of Could I um, ask a follow up question about this? Uh, so it's like look at at the half winning you and you prime play the similar role and at one because it's like both like increasing you or increasing you prime we can get a quantum anomalous Hall effect but at the one third feeling it like they play the different role right but at the one third feeling uh if you have say you have a finite u if, so okay, in the in the half filling, both U and U prime are energy penalties for you know, for electrons trying to move to the trying uh, try, trying to move or occupy the same spatial location in the same orbital. If you're at the one third filling case uh, or one sixth filling uh, in the spinful system, uh, as the as you increase U prime, as the system polarizes. So as if U prime is very low, if that's the dominant energy scale, then the system will just polarize ferromagnetically because if you have spins in all one direction, then uh, you, the energy penalty U prime is zero. However, U, oh, so, sorry, you, oh, thanks. I mean, you, you increase U and uh, you polarize, sorry, sorry, you, you polarize ferromagnetically. Now, if you're in a ferromagnetic state, U, U drops out. But U prime will tell you how now all your polarized spins will try to arrange themselves. Uh, if U prime is zero, then uh, essentially your spin polarized electrons will just fill the band up to the Fermi energy. Um, if U prime is non zero and it becomes larger, they'll try to arrange each other so they don't pay this repulsion. And at some point, since this is a uh, uh, since if you're in a spin polar state, you're in a uh, churn band, you can think of the electrons in the churn band analogous to a lander level. So the electrons have sort of a guiding center and the, uh, and, the, and, the reg and the regular angular momentum that you can define by the guiding center coordinate. U prime essentially is somewhat analogous. Actually, you can make this analogy more explicit. Uh, we have an older work on this uh, and other groups here too in, this, in these papers down here. Uh, U prime essentially amounts to a uh, uh, V1 pseudo potential, which is an energy penalty for electrons uh, to have uh, um, uh, two electrons to be in a relative angular momentum state differing by one. So if they can't be in a relative angular momentum state differing by one, they'll be in a relative angular momentum state of at least differing by three, which is just the Laughlin state, which is the Zi minus Zj to the uh, that's that's your Laughlin wave function. So actually, here U and U prime are very different. That's that's the reason why they're, they're having a very different physics. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my second question is about uh, we know that in TBG the strains and uh, twist angle disorder uh, affects the band structure a lot and affects the Phase diagram a lot. So in your um, you talked about the spin of the coupling and the three D layers. So do you have any idea how 
of the 3D layers also can have a help will the uh, increase oh, the 3D, or decrease. Sorry, the three D, this one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do, we don't really have spin overt coupling in this problem. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, um, in two D, the spin overt coupling, the materials will have easier to have the twist angle disorder and the strains. Or uh, do you have any comments on that? Oh, uh, it's on. Uh, so these the calculations that we did are fully relaxed calculations. So in principle, you allow for local uh, domain relaxation. However, uh, uh question i think here the situation is a little more severe because now you can think about you know twist angle disorder in the third dimension where now you don't have only have one twist angle but you can have a twist angle disorder along each along each possible layer and actually i think that would be a very so we don't know but that would be a very interesting problem to study mm -hmm. thanks I also have a question about the 3D stacking, which is just what are the what's the difference between the A and A prime layers? Uh, these are just the these are oh these are just the different stackings the different uh, uh, relative positions of the transition metals in the two in the two layers. So this is the A, A B analogy and uh, T M Ds. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So they're just translated. So this this by... is just showing here. This is just showing examples for uh, alternating twist for graphene for tungsten diselenide and for HBM. So let's see what this is. So are the flat bands that you're getting in 3D really, are they different than having just separate 2D systems which are stacked and decoupled from each other? Yeah, so the fundamental, que the fundamental question is, are you just getting a trivial system where you move your orbitals so far away from each other that you don't get any hopping? Uh, not. Yeah. And I think sort of the naive answer is that Actually, this is true, and that's also true for all TMD-like systems. Like, unlike the magic angle conditions in graphene, in general twisted semiconducting systems, the low energy physics is, always arises from the fact that you're localizing charge puddles that, and you're changing the position and shape of the charge puddles and move them further away. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so then you would probably not expect like topological effects in the third direction because um, you're kind of just localizing in the third direction here. Uh, so that's, that's a good question. So in principle, uh, while you're localizing in the third direction, localizing just means that you're sort of separating out isolated bands that become progressively flatter as uh, sort of mm -hmm. the hopping in the third dimension, mm -hmm. but also in the in-plane dimensions are quenched. So now I think the question of topology is still a question of what is the structure of the orbitals that form sort of these sets of bands. And you can envision similar to the case of the TMDs or uh, a scenario where you have not one, but two possible orbitals that make up a single Moray charge puddle. And then think about spin orbit coupling, giving you just the right interesting coupling between these orbitals that again can mm -hmm. re realize, say, a three dimensional topological insulator or something more interesting. Hmm. So I think really one would have to think about materials where these charge puddles are a little more involved in us. They might have mm -hmm. multi orbital character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ask what I are see. the consequences of that? Now the band gaps, of course, would be very small. Uh, so you would have topological gaps that are MeV energy scales. Yeah, but uh, that's kind of already happening in all the twisted heterostructures. I mean, maybe it's a little bit exactly. better, but it's, yeah. it's still yeah. pretty small. 
Exactly. And the question for 3D, I guess, is whether something similarly nice can happen that you now this MEV energy scale competes with spin orbit coupling, which is also MEV energy scale, mm -hmm. giving sort of a uh, combination of a flat band and still um, tens or MEV, uh, tens of MEVs uh, topological gap. Mm -hmm. But presumably, one could also generalize this to one could imagine having a vial system in which uh, the vial semi metal now appears, but in these uh, dispersion quenched uh, uh, bands formed from uh, the Moray charge puddles. Yeah, maybe that's uh, more, uh, more immediately feasible that it could happen. Yeah, so I, I'm not really sure what the what the I mean, what would the system what what should the system have in order to do this? <laughs> but uh, presumably, one could just essentially yet again do like a potential engineering analogy of like trying to take a vial semi metal a simple vial semi metal model and trying to engineer a more potential. Yeah. Yeah. I I know there is a work from the uh, Marlins group. They proposed it the 3D, uh, like, like the spiral tasting structure that may be relevant to the wilds and metals. Uh, which, which group? Uh, 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 Maryland, uh, CMTC. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, exactly, the Sarma, yeah. So yeah. just, oh, oh, I stopped sharing. So yeah, actually I had the reference in the slides. So what they're proposing is, uh, so they're essentially looking at a continuously twisted structure and study this from a... a yeah. Martin, I also have a question. Like in your earlier work, um, you guys also showed that you had bands which could be like localized in 1D and dispersing in 2D, uh, in, in the other D. Um, <laughs> so is there is there anything interesting more to look at in that direction? Like now you have 1D flat bands. Uh, can you... And I don't know what kind of 1D states you, you'd be interested in studying or is are you kind of not working on that? Actually, this is one thing that we're, uh, oh, wow. Okay, subtitles are on again. Uh, so uh, this is one thing we're working on. So actually one interesting generalization is to ask how does this, how does this work in a Dirac system? So you can think of uh, a rectangular lattice Dirac uh, system, uh, an mm -hmm. example, a possible example for this, although unclear how feasible this would be to engineer in practice, something mm -hmm. like borophene, where now if you have a rectangular lattice of Dirac fermions with a two-fold rotation symmetry, mm -hmm. then if you stack them on top of each other, you again get magic angle conditions, yeah. which now, however, have an intrinsic anisotropy. So you can get a different magic angle condition for the two different spatial dimensions. Yeah. And this gives you sort of an interference tunable condition mm -hmm. to generate, generate sort of interpolate between the coupled wire and the two-dimensional limit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think the interesting thing would be then to look at uh, this is something we haven't really like, explored yet, is to look at sort of what can we get out of such coupled wire constructions? And is there something sort of, sort of something interesting and realistic one could propose? Yeah, I mean, you know there's a lot of work in the topological community on wire construction. So is there any way the to other, the other, yes. wire construction? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I mean, Char Charlie Kane pioneered a lot of the. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess you're in the right place for so that. I think, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So actually, it is one of the things we're discussing. Uh, so yeah, one interesting thing would be to realize one of these constructions in a twisted model. And the idea, uh, one interesting corollary of this is also, you know, the, since these wires are spatially separated now on more length scales. For instance, if you put such a system in a magnetic field, sort of the flux encompassed between sort of unit cells uh, is mm -hmm. fairly large, uh, mm -hmm. giving access to sort of a very unconventional large flux regime for say yeah. chiral wire construction. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. That was, you know, yeah. Previously, people were thinking about making these out of actual wires, and it didn't seem like it would be so incredibly. Maybe it's promising, maybe it's not. So this was definitely that uh, definitely is a cool idea. Yeah, if if sort of there's if disorder is under control, this should give you sort mm -hmm. of a very regular pattern of uh, one dimensional. Yeah. That's very cool.
Yeah, by the way, Martin, so currently we're uh, working um, following your previous um, 15 PIL paper on the ideal flat band. So we have a, a, a draft prepared and uh, um, probably will publish soon. So do you have time oh, okay. to, to, to talk afterwards? So maybe sure. you can talk in some details. Sure, would be, yeah, sure, we'd be glad to. Yeah, so I will send you an email to schedule a time. Okay, sounds okay. good. Mm -hmm. So actually, I'm I'm free until three p.m. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so today I have some uh, uh, appointments, okay. but maybe uh, some tomorrow or something. Yeah, so, so, sounds good. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are you studying? Just out of curiosity. So what? Yeah. So you studied C equals to a higher ideal fat band. We studied C equals uh, to one fat band. Uh huh. So I see. A, yeah. So yeah. it's uh the is this elliptic theta function uh, construction? Yeah. Yeah. Elliptic theta function. Uh, we can in this limit we can have some precise uh, duality between lambda levels. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm. Yeah, I'm curious to hear more about this. Yeah, that's mm. thanks. That's uh, you, you and Jen. Uh, yeah, and Andy and other um, collaborators. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm, great. Great. Well, thanks so much for organizing. Um, yeah, this was super interesting, Martin. Thanks for um, thanks for giving us the overview of a lot of. It looks like you've been working on a lot of stuff in the past year, so it's great to catch up on this. And yeah, maybe we can chat Zoom and G about the other stuff. That would be really fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say hi. Sorry, I was late. I had hi, Andy. listening to the Simon's collaboration proposal from Alan McDonald and others. Oh, great. So. Um, we'll see. By the way, on my Zoom screen, there seems to be a um, voice to text thing. Are you seeing that's, this? I think that's my fault somehow. It's my. Uh, oh, here we go. Well, I'm just curious. It's it's you know it's not. Oh, so my PowerPoint that. automatically switches this on if I don't pay attention. Yeah, uh, that, uh, actually, I like that. How do you turn that on? I just... There's a button. Like if I right click on my screen, it says Start Subtitles. Maybe um, I need to have subtitles is 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 uh, sound to text. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, it doesn't like physics very much. I think it's better for sort of regular speech. <laughs> well, these <clears throat> translation things are tough, but no doubt it will get better. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So look, at, I'm sorry. I have a, a, a slightly different question. Um, related to another thing the grant side of the Simons Foundation is doing. Um, and that is, uh, uh, let's say, churn Simons theories generally. Right. And I guess my question is, uh, you know, there, well, so um, clearly, you know, there's a lot of topolo equilibrium topological field theory stuff, which various people are doing. Mm -hmm. um, some of which falls under the heading churn Simons, or, right? But right. Um, are there any interesting non-equilibrium effects? I mean, I s seem to remember that some of your work with Van Hell could be put into that language. Of activating or deactivating topological terms by appropriate driving. Yeah, that's uh, that. Or is that too that's much a good stretch? No, so I mean, I'm thinking about so how would I justify something like integrating out my electrons in a non equilibrium setting? So I can, of course. Okay, so I mean, there's 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 two angles to this, right? So on one hand, there's sort of the Jern Simons theory of a sort of the integer quantum Hall effect, where my effective action is the regular Jern Simons theory. On the other hand, there's the Jern Simons flux attachment for mm. fractionalized spaces. Yeah, where I presume for energetic reasons that it's 
to do, good for electrons to attach a flux and then I integrate out my electrons and I get mm -hmm. transform series. So I guess in principle, one can still do this in a non-equilibrium setting, right? But one would have to justify why. Yeah. Uh, so the motivation in, is generally that in the flux attached theory, you just arrive at an effective theory of new Landau levels where one now at Landau level is fully filled and one can make energetic argument that this is hence a very stable configuration. In a non-equilibrium setting, if I have an energetic separation, if I have some energy scale separation between say an external, okay, maybe I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in the wrong way. Like if I were thinking say about a driven system, like if I drive in such a way that I still have an energetic separation with respect to my cycloton frequency in the original system, uh, maybe this could be justified to uh -huh. think about a dynamical transcendence theory that arises. Right. From writing down like a like a catalytic yeah, think... to the flux attachment again and integrate out the electrons. I think so the transcendence that's theory that's is intrinsically in three dimensions. So you have X, Y, and a T. So fundamentally, it's possible to have T. But what is the microscopic model that transcendence arise for some non equilibrium systems? Like imagine then, you have a fractional, imagine you have a fractional, there was actually uh, two or three proposals recently. Uh, Imagine you have a land, you have a set of Landau levels, and you're driving this at frequencies that are detuned. Say the Landau level resonances are very sharp, so you have a perfectly clean system, and you're driving off resonance from the Landau levels. Then naively, if the driving is not too strong, at least for short times, there's again maybe pre-thermalization arguments that the system should just see this as some effective adiabatic perturbation, uh, and then maybe one could still justify sort of the same procedure of doing a turn Simon's construction. But in some sense, maybe that's not what you're asking, Andy, right? Because that would just give you some renormalized equilibrium turn Simon's theory, so. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think there are several different things that I'm asking. Um, but to start with, even we could generalize beyond turn Simon's in that sense and just ask, you know, are there ways if we have systems with interesting properties that can be described by topological field theories of whatever sort mm -hmm. um, or theories with interesting both topological and non-topological excitations like spin liquids or something uh, you okay. know is there a way to control these um by non-equilibrium means is there a way to um you know move across a phase boundary into a topological regime for okay, maybe maybe okay maybe maybe this doesn't work but one one idea like imagine for instance for say for a 3d ti we have these uh theta terms that arise in the effective topological field theory yeah. right so and one way of getting them is again sort of this procedure of integrating essentially integrating out get electrons coupled to a gauge field now if i usually this is kind of like a linear response construction right uh so it's essentially trying to devise a theory for like, if I have a weak electromagnetic perturbation, I get now an E dot B term that couples my electric field to a magnetic field coupled by a theta term. So if I, would it be sensible? Like if I did this in say a non-equilibrium setting and non-perturbatively, mm -hmm. I should get some other contributions which should give me a coupling between my field and my theta term. So for instance, I could imagine like there should be some, you know, a, a term in my field theory that will change my theta term as a dynamical variable as a function mm -hmm. of the driving field. Yeah. Yeah, so that's sort of the thing I had in mind. And I think what you're saying is that this is um, at least not something that anybody's thought about and possibly something that would be quite hard to realize. I mean, one, one idea that I had that, again, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's very physically motivated, but you can have, you can have different topological phases that 
like you can condense quasi particles to get between different topological phases mm -hmm. um, that have gapped boundaries with each other. And I guess one thing I was wondering was, could you condense this thing? Could you have like a quench, like a, um, yeah, could you condense this thing as a function of time? And is there some is there some interesting uh, dynamics of entanglement that are there? But I mean, I haven't I haven't actually thought about this. It's just some vague words that I've written down on on some vague proposals. Yeah. <laughs> in the past. Right. Well, but you know, I always wondered what would happen if you just by whatever means did a quench into a topological phase. I think in quantum in on all levels, I, I know uh, in quantum in on all levels, I know some examples. So suppose you change the metric of some for instance suddenly, and you see how the system evolves, and people yeah. find that this is related to the graviton mode at long wavelengths, and they can precisely uh, calculate uh, the period of that and match well with your merits. This is the only example I know about quantum dynamics. But I think probably you are saying different things like periodic oh. driving or not. Oh. Well, they're different. I mean, there's. I, I was. I, I, um, I was just trying to think if there are any non-equilibrium connections. Yeah, I mean, and also lately people have been classifying floquet topological phases. Right. This is a little bit different than applying a driving field to an existing topological phase. Yeah. I think. Yeah, but there is certainly people have talked about Foucault topological phases. So you could ask uh, what are their properties and you could ask what happens if you turn them on and off. Yeah. Yeah, so I just, I wonder if there's anything interesting. There. Yeah, so um, so there are different types of transimers. So I, as I know, one is the U1 abelian gauge transimers, uh, which is the most usual one, another is Related to the geometric degree of freedom of the, for example, fraction quantum hall, that's the uh, related to the um, connection field. If you think of connection field as right. a U1 gauge field, this is a new type of transimers. So the quantum dynamics is more or less based on that degree of freedom. So I think this geometric degree of freedom should also exist in other systems because it's fundamental. Mm -hmm. what, what's, what's the observable of this? Is that like some Hall viscosity or something? Yeah, 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 right. Hall viscosity is, is the consequence of this geometric transimers term and a thermal Hall um, related. Right, okay. Thanks. Look at the, this is this is interesting. I may come back to you. It depends. My motivation actually um, is just that that um, they are organizing a little symposium on Chern Simon's effects, which is driven by uh, um, possibility of seeing of using these cosmological telescopes to see some kind of birefringence in the cosmic microwave background that might or might not reveal the existence of some kind of churn simons term in the inflation field. Uh, so it's not a condensed matter. <laughs> well, um, so I just am trying to think of uh, condensed matter things that are interesting. Okay. Um, that could also be part of this, particularly if, you know, they're talking about funding research in this area. And a lot of the equilibrium churn simons stuff, to my mind, has been done, basically. Right. You know, I don't know what the new questions are uh, in our world. So anyway, that was my motivation. That's, uh... So, all right, anyway, thank you very much. This is like um, cycling back to this. I mean, yeah. is it really, so, oh, no, no, okay, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean, is it is it really so unrealistic? To think? I mean, essentially, maybe this has already been proposed, just not put in this language, like a sort of non-equilibrium controllable axion insulator. Yeah. Just thinking about 
so not effective field theory of an axion insulator that's pushed away from equilibrium. Yeah. <coughs> well, I mean, no, that's not Charles Simons, but yeah, but but well, we we could say topology more generally. Um, I, mean, I yeah. think that I when we were talking to um, David Vanderbilt's student Nicodemus, I think that he I vaguely remember him mentioning something like this. And now that you're saying it, it sounds like exactly something that David uh -huh. would be thinking about. Um, but I don't know if they have a paper on that or if yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, well, maybe I'll ask David. But, you know, I. So, was, David, David Reitman? Which no, 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 Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt. Oh, Vander, Vanderbilt. So. Yeah, but I always wondered, you know, these topological terms imply something about gauge fields and so on. And, uh, you know, I, in one sense, I can't continuously tune them away, right? They have, they have coefficients which are just numbers, but on the other hand, there should be some control parameter that turns this thing on and off and that shows up somehow in, you know, finite length scale dynamics of the theory. Right. So, so how it, it, is, it, is it the matter of, you know, if I quench into a topological phase from a non-topological one, I get a C of, you know, various vor generalized vortex and anti-vortex uh, configurations that anneal each other out or uh... you know do I have like a, a, a term with, uh, that my topological theory has a gauge symmetry effective gauge symmetry which is broken in the non-topological phase so there's something like a mass term for a gauge for a, some a, a field which becomes a gauge field as I tune some parameter because its mass goes to zero or something. I mean, it seems like there could be multiple, um, you know, multiple types of transitions. One of them would be a mass term condensing stuff, which would take you between like different sorts of compatible topological mm -hmm. phases. And then it seems like there's going to be other transitions like between topological and trivial, which probably require some gap closing phase transition. So you'd need to like be, yeah, then that's a bit more, you need to have a more complicated model. Mm -hmm. oh. And this effective theory can be compared with numerical results on microscopic Hamptonians. Yeah, right. Yeah. For the fractional quantum hall, I know some works and I can send you if you are interested. Yeah, that would be fun.